existentialist so Sartre's in Transcendence of the Ego are defined by the fact that they have immersed man back in the world. That is, as he says there, they have restored to his anguish and his sufferings and to his rebellions to their full weight. Yet if his aim comprises one of the chief appeals of existentialism, it has also been the source of one, its, one of its most trenchant criticisms. In other words, if an emphasis on lived existence has attracted those frustrated with the abstractions of modern philosophy, it has also underscored a major objection. And what this is can be summed up with the term humanism. For influenced by Heidegger's lesser on humanism, structuralist and post-structuralist critics have all suggested that this emphasis is synonymous with a naive or romantic humanist idea of the subject. That is, they have suggested that existentialism's return to man amounts at best to the radicalization of an isolated and discredited subject-entity concept. And as such, continuing, it is the aim of this paper then to refute this charge. In short, it is the aim of this paper to explain how Sartrean existentialism's concern for man does not necessarily entail a philosophically limited humanism. However, before we can show how this is the case, it is necessary to say something more. That is, it's necessary first to explain more specifically what humanism actually is, what is limited about it, and why existentialism is identified with it. And it is to answer these questions, then, that we must first look to Heidegger's letter on humanism. This is because it is there that Heidegger outlines an answer to all three questions. And taking the initial two first, we can say that Heidegger's argument against humanism there is based on the idea that it exists as a certain kind of science of the human. In other words, the limitation of humanism derives from a notion implied by the idea of the humanities. That is, its limitation is that it exists as a complementary science, doing for the human what the natural sciences do for the material world. For humanism, like science in relation to the physical, assumes that man is an isolatable field about which, is, about which it is possible to conduct a neutral, originary inquiry. The problem, however, with such an approach for Heidegger is evident. For in assuming it is possible to have an isolated original inquiry into man, humanism already makes a certain ontological assumption about its object. That is, without realising it, humanism makes an assumption about the relation of being to the essence of man. And it does so insofar as it positions man as an isolatable object of knowledge. For humanism does not ask whether man stands in a unique relation to being which cannot be known in this way, or whether man must fundamentally be caught up with being. And it cannot do so since this would mean abandoning the idea of man as an isolatable theoretical field. Rather, it presumes by dint of its method that we, lo we quote, locate, locate man within being as one being among others, a being that, even if possessed of unique qualities, is ontologically equivalent to other beings. And this means, as Heidegger has argued in Being in Time, that we take man as, quote, an, in an instance or special case of some genus of entities of things that are present at hand. In other words, no matter how subtle or unprejudiced humanism believes its inquiries to be, it can never escape the characterization of man in terms of presence. That is, no matter how different from other entities man is seen to be, humanism's method ends up construing him as another entity in the world. In short, humanism ends up construing him in terms of an is to which it is possible to ascribe properties or attributes like subjectivity or reason. Thus, to address our previous question, we can say that the problem with humanism in this way is that it fails to, as Heidegger puts it, think the essence of man more primordially. In short, it fails to consider whether man stands in a different relation to being than that of an entity. As such, we can argue, it does not consider whether man might be ultimately more than a variation on Descartes' thing that thinks. Yet why is it that Heidegger also, to look at our third question, considers existentialism's return to man to be the latest mode of such humanism? The answer lies in reflection on, again, considering Descartes, what we might mean by saying man is more than a thinking subject. Whereas Heidegger makes clear, though, though uh, quote, the essence of man consists in his being more than merely human, if this is represented as being a rational creature, more must not be understood here additively, as if the traditional definition of man were indeed to remain basic, only elaborated by means of an existential postscript. In other words, Heidegger sees the danger of existentialism being that it simply adds to the humanist understanding of man without fundamentally challenging it. That is, its return to man simply means, as Crowell puts it, emphasising the contingent psychological and situ situational factors in human life in contrast to the life of a purely rational agent. And in this way, for Heidegger, existentialism fails to get beyond the humanist project, 
Rather, it returns to its return to existence with its emphasis on the personal dimensions of subjectivity simply completes that project. Consequently, we have now addressed our initial questions. That is, we have seen both why humanism is philosophically limited and why Sartre and existentialism might be identified with it. However, it will be the contention of this paper that Heidegger is only half right here. In other words, we will argue that whilst he is right to say that humanism is unable to conduct a truly originary inquiry into man's being, he is wrong to identify Sartre with such a limitation. Instead, we will argue that Sartre's inquiry into and conception of man is decidedly non-humanist. And further, questioning the claim that Sartre does not ask about the relation of being to the essence of man, we will show how one of the major objections to Sartrean existentialism does not hold. Yet how are we to proceed in this project? How are we to refute this objection and elaborate Sartre's non-humanist conception of man? Well, we begin to do this by first noting against Heidegger that Sartre was concerned with being and ontology. For as he says towards the end of being and nothingness, my ultimate and initial project is always the, is always the outline of a so solution of the problem of being. Yet such an ontology, critically for us, does not proceed by an abstraction from human existence. In short, it, it avoids Patterson's, Patterson's distinction between, on the one hand, universal ontology, and on the other, the concrete and immediate situation of individual existence. Rather, we can say it proceeds by deriving an ontology precisely from man's concrete existence experience. And this is significant because it is then such a phenomenological ontology which will give us that non-humanist conception of man. But how, we can ask continuing, does it, does it do this? And indeed, isn't an ontology beginning with man a contradiction which simply returns us to the humanism we were trying to escape? Well, to address the second question first, we can say the answer is no. And this is because what we start with is not man as an object of inquiry or knowledge, but with the first person phenomenological experience of living men. In fact, it is a very conflation of these two terms which prevents a proper appreciation of the latter. That is, as Le Levy points out, we, mis we misunderstand our own being in the world and take ourselves for disinterested spectators. Furthermore, an authentic recovery of our experience as it is actually lived is ontological insofar as, unlike humanism, it precedes, it precedes any assumptions about what man or being is. For as Heidegger says, the term phenomenology expresses a maxim which can be formulated as to the things themselves. It is opposed to all free-floating constructions and accidental findings. And this means that true phenomenology can open the way for a genuine inquiry into being. That is, because phenomenology recovers an experience prior to existing ontological assumptions, it can serve as a basis for an unprejudiced exploration of man's relation to being. However, that is not of course to say that recovering such an experience is necessarily easy. Nor is it something we ordinarily do when we believe we are recalling or describing some episode. For as, her, for as herself pointed out, awareness of our own experience is systematically distorted by ingrained commonsensical assumptions about the way the world is. And this has, has at its heart the problem that we project the nature of reflective experience onto all experience. That is, since explicit recalling involves reflection, we usually interpret any experience through the lens of the subject-object parody of the reflective mode. Nevertheless, the difficulty here is not intractable, and how we are to overcome it is indicated by Sartre in Transcendence of the Ego. This is because, as he says there, uh, quote, obviously we need to resort to concrete experience, and this may seem impossible, since an experience of this kind is by definition reflective, in other words, endowed with an eye. But all unreflected consciousness, being a non-fetic consciousness of itself, leaves behind it a non-fetic memory that can be consulted. All that is required for this is to try to reconstitute the complete moment in which this unreflected consciousness appeared, and this is by definition always possible. For instance, I was now just absorbed in my reading. In other words, then, there is a domain of pre-reflective experience, unreflected consciousness, which is prior to reflective stepping back from the world and the theory it gives rise to. That is to say, there is a mode of experience not involving explicit reflections, as when, I as when I am absorbed in an activity, which is given free from prior ontological assumptions. And this can thus serve as the basis for an unbiased phenomenological ontology. Secondly, though, Sartre also suggests it is possible to recover the nature of such experience without this necessarily being distorted by reflection. But it is, if, it is as if original experience leaves behind a trace, a non-fetic memory which lingers in subsequent consciousness like ripples on water. 
and this means with sufficient effort and by holding in check our tendency to interpret the experience, we can discern its contours. In short, with sensitivity to certain moments of present consciousness, we can recover the pre-reflective without a reflective reconstructive leap into a past consciousness. But why to return is this significant? How does the possibility of recovering an original pre-reflective experience get us closer to Sartre's non-humanist conception of man? The answer is that it does so by providing the starting point for a phenomenological ontology. And we will see how this is the case when we look at what the nature of that starting point is. Put differently, we will see how Sartre challenges the humanist subject entity by looking at what is discovered in this newly opened domain of the pre-reflective. This is because, continuing, what Sartre uncovers there is that a substantial self or I is absent. For as he says, when I run after a tram, when I look at the time, when I become absorbed in the contemplation of the portrait, there is no I. In other words, when we look with sufficient honesty to our pre-reflective experience, we find there is no independent subject present. That is, whilst our attachment to the self at the reflective mode makes us want to avoid seeing this, we do not find, as Gardner puts it, something substantial lying behind and supporting the stream of con our consciousness. Rather, in one sense, all we uncover, as Sartre says, is consciousness of the tram needing to be caught. In short, all we find is consciousness of transcendent objects, consciousness of the world. And it is thus clear what implications this has for the humanist idea of the subject. For if, as Sartre says, there is no consciousness which is not a positing of a transcendent object, then there is, on a fundamental level, no distinct or substantial domain of the subject either. That is, if pre-reflective experience of ourself reveals only this relation to the world, then the subject entity, of human, subject entity of humanism no longer holds. Yet it is also apparent that if the humanist conception of man is with this called into question, this is only a starting point for Sartre. This is because he must not merely suggest that the humanist idea of man is wrong, but must put in its place an alternative, non-humanist conception. And the first and most obvious problem in this case is what now man for Sartre can mean at all. Put in other words then, the initial problem here is that man may appear to drop out of the picture entirely. For if phenomenology has revealed that there is only intentional consciousness of objects, then how do we distinguish consciousness at all? That is, if there is nothing other than intentional positing of the world, then don't we risk simply reducing man to world? The answer we suggest is no. And the reason for this, concern, um, the reason for this concerns the nature of that intentional positing. For a description of pre-reflective experience reveals that this is not merely a passive reflection of the world, but an activity or bringing forth in relation to it. And what this means then is that even if, as Sartre says, consciousness has no content, it is, distingu it is distinguished by this active relation. In other words, even if man exists as nothing other than the positing of the world, he nonetheless is distinguished by this very positing relation to it. But whilst there is no isolated domain of man, he still stands out as the activity of that positing. And this means as such that it is possible to talk about man as exclusively worldly and there being no separate subject entity without dissolving him into that world altogether. However, where does this leave us overall in terms of our argument? Where does this point about man as active relation leave us in terms of our effort to develop a Sartrean non-humanist conception of man? Well, it represents progress, but we started by saying that the humanist conception could be overcome by developing a phenomenological ontology in Sartre. In other words, we said that an authentic recovery of our lived experience could serve as a starting point to think the essence of man more primordially. That is, experience could serve as the basis for grasping man on a level prior to the ontological assumptions of humanism. And further, we saw that this was evidence when a proper description of pre-reflective experience revealed man as only intentional consciousness of the world. This is because we saw there that not only was man not the subject entity of humanism, but that he could be understood as a relation of active positing. In short, we saw that man could be both nothing other than the world and yet be distinct from it by being a relation to that world. And as such, it's apparent that with this we gave the basis for an alternative non-humanist conception of man's being. Yet it is also apparent that this is only a starting point. For if the idea that, as Gardner has observed, consciousness is a relation allows us to get beyond humanism, this still leaves the question of what and exactly this relation consists. In brief, this leaves the question of what it means to say that man is a relation to the world rather than just having one. And as such, it is the job of phenomenological ontology and the rest of our discussion to make sense of this claim. Put another way then, 
In order properly to develop Sardis' non humanist conception of man, we must take further steps. For if we cannot explain how man as relation can be rendered theoretically explicable, we cannot meaningfully provide an alternative to humanism as subject entity. And if we cannot do this, a non humanist phenomenological existentialism cannot be defended. But how are we to achieve this? How are we to understand, as Sartre says, the relation which we call being in the world? Well, according to Sartre, we can do so on the basis of negation. For in our practical, absorbed dealings with the world, we find that it is the activity of negating which marks out a distinction on the ground of the world. And as such, then, an inquiry into man as relation proceeds from negation, since with this there is an essential distinction from a world which is nonetheless bound up with it. In short, it is with this that we find the experiential manifestation of man as both nothing other than world, yet standing out from it. However, it is also apparent that this cannot represent the end of our inquiry. For if an account of real negation might show us how man as relation is theoretically explicable, it can do so only once further questions have been answered. In different words, non-being can point the way towards a non-humanist conception of man only once it it itself has been rendered intelligible. And we can achieve this only by looking at the theoretical criticism of this notion. For we can show how real real non-being makes sense by indicating how it avoids the objections made to its intelligibility. That is, we can show how non-being is intelligible, and thus how it renders man as relation intelligible, only by seeing what it must be to avoid those criti- to avoid those criticisms. So, what then are these objections? What are those criticism- criticisms we need to overcome? The most obvious and fundamental one is that non-being is not in fact real, and this objection can be summed up in the idea that negation is only a quality of judgment. To explain that. This is a criticism that non-being, as when we discover a door to be not locked, is merely a subjective projection of a certain concept. As Sartre says, then, this means that negate, quote, the negation, negation, the result of concrete psychic operations, is supported in existence by these very operations and is incapable of existing by itself. So, for instance, when we look in our wallets expecting to find 20 euros and find only 10, we do not really discover the non-being of the 20, but just the being of the 10. And this means that when negation comes into being, it is merely as an extrinsic judgment imposed afterwards. In short, it is a post hoc judgment existing by the contrast between what was expected and what was found, and thus having no real basis in the world. Yet how then are we able to avoid this? How are we we to deal with this objection and thus help render real non-being intelligible? The answer for Sartre, we can say, is twofold. But firstly, he wishes to disprove the idea that, quote, Ordinary experience reduced to itself does not seem to disclose to us any non-being. In other words, he seeks to show that we do, in fact, encounter real non-being in pre-reflective experience. That is, it's not merely a, con- a concept projected onto it. And second, secondly, he intends to use this description of a concrete encounter with objective non-being to demonstrate a further point. That is, he seeks to use this description as a base for showing how even though well, non-being always appears within the limits of human expectation, it is still part of the objective world. In short, he attempts to overcome this objection by showing that non-being is real and theoretically how such real existence, how real existence of nothingness is possible. It is to demonstrate both these points, then, that Sartre turns to a particular type of experience. That is, to counter the objection that negation has only a conceptual existence, he first looks to a concrete situation where he believes we encounter real non-being. And this is the experience of absence. In other words, Sartre hopes to show by accurately describing this existential experience that we do in fact encounter non-being in the world, and that hence nothingness is not merely an empty empty subjective concept. So how then does he begin in this enterprise? He starts, we can say, by giving the example of the absence of a friend we had agreed to meet in the cafe at a particular time. That is, he gives the example of Pierre's absence from the cafe. To understand Sartre's interpretation of the situation, though, and hence how we can make sense of real non-being, it is necessary first to understand something else here. That is, to understand Sartre's interpretation of absence, we must look at the nature of what he calls figure and ground. For explaining that, against the common sense view, we can say that we never straightforwardly just see in the, in the cafe a series of clearly differentiated static objects in their fullness. Rather, according to Sartre, and is the case with, as is the case with all perception, what we see in the cafe initially is in fact an undifferentiated totality. That is, we see a sort of amorphous backdrop organised in relation to the potential emergence of Pierre as a figure. For, rather than distinct cups, chairs and people, what we see is an indistinct ground 
organised as not being the figure, as the object of a purely marginal attention. And it is this idea of figure and ground then which will allow us to understand how absence is interpreted for its art. To elaborate on how this is the case further, we can start by saying that the nature of the ground is dependent on the status of the figure in relation to which it is marginal. What we mean by this is that how the ground is given to us will depend on whether the figure, the focus of our attention, is still being searched for, found as present, or found to be absent. So to return to our example then, we see that when we are searching for Pierre in the cafe, we find the figure ground relation given in a particular way. We can say this relation can at this stage be defined in terms of indeterminacy and movement. As Sartre says, explaining, each element of the setting, a person, a table, a chair, attempts to isolate itself, to lift itself upon the ground constituted by the totality of the other objects, only to fall back once more into the undifferentiation of this ground. Continuing from what Sartre implies then, we can say that insofar as I am searching for PR, what is figure and what is ground is indeterminate. That is, because the figure has not yet emerged, aspects of the potential ground fleetingly raise themselves as potentially being the figure. In short, they raise themselves as potentially being Pierre before being returned to the marginal totality of the ground as not Pierre. So, for instance, when I spot a figure near the bar, he is fleetingly raised as a possible, raised as a possible distinct focus of attention, only to collapse again into the undifferentiated ground. However, this figure-ground relation defined in its indeterminacy by a movement towards as an as, um, as yet unrevealed figure would be transformed if we were in fact then to discover Pierre. As Sartre says, if I should finally discover Pierre, my intuition would be filled by a solid element. I should suddenly be arrested by his face and the whole cafe would organise itself around him as a discrete presence. In other words, in terms of figure and ground, both movement and indeterminacy would disappear. Instead, the ground losing its dynamic self-collapsing quality will be organised as a definite and static, albeit marginal, presence, now standing in a clear relation to Pierre as figure. So, to return to our essential concern, what would happen if Pierre was, were not there? How is the relationship of figure and ground transformed when Pierre, on the other hand, is not found? So, that answer can be understood in relation to what we have said happens when Pierre is found. But just as Pierre's presence as figure organises the rest of the cafe as a fixed, present ground, then Pierre's absence fixes the rest of the cafe on the basis of that absence. To elaborate then, as Sartre says, his absence fixes the cafe in its evanescence. What this means is that the cafe is indeed fixed. It is no longer in the flow of indeterminacy, but it is fixed in relation to a figure which is not there. As Gardner puts it, Pierre's absence fixes the cafe which carries and presents the demanded figure of Pierre. And this means that in turn, the ground which is fixed carries with it everywhere the reference to the evanescent collapse between figure and ground. As Sartre emphasises, this figure which slips constantly between my look and the solid real objects of the cafe is precisely a perpetual disappearance. In other words, it is, a dis it is the disintegration which determines something that is not Pierre which is now fixed and given in relation to the entire cafe. And it is as such that, as Sartre says, what is offered to intuition is a flickering of nothingness. That is, the collapse which was, when searching for Pierre, only fleetingly perceived, is now clearly intuited in the shimmering unfullness of the cafe. We have here been given an intimation of non-being. Where does all this leave us, though? What can, we, what can we now say, given that analysis of figure and ground has revealed Pierre's absence as an actually experienced intimation of real non-being? The answer is multifaceted. To start off with and to return to our immediate concern, this description of absence is a rebuttal of, to the common sense view and its claim that we never really see any absence in the cafe at all. That is, that phenomenological description of the cafe undermines the naive assumption that the cafe is a fullness of being. For it undermines the fact, the, the idea, that all we ever see there are a series of fully present objects. Rather, our analysis has shown that Pierre's absence is real and is uncovered in the strange indeterminacy of the cafe as a whole. In short, it is shown that it exists in the now observable gap between the object, of, the object as figure and ground, with Pierre's absence not permitting them to settle as either. Yet how does this help with our more general inquiry? How does this then help us to understand how real non-being is intelligible, and hence how man as relation with non-being as the basis of that relation can be rendered theoretically explicable? Well, it does so insofar as, insofar as it addressed one objection to the idea of real non-being. That is, it has shown that non how non-being is given in experience and is not merely an empty concept. 
Yet we have still not shown how this experience in fact corresponds to anything actual in the world. In different words, we have not yet shown how this experienced non-being could be more than could be more than subjective and is part of the structure of the real. To understand Sartre's answer to this problem, though, it is necessary to consider more closely the exact purpose and status of his description regarding Pierre. But the purpose of Sartre's description of the existential experience of absence in the cafe is not to describe a non-being which is always in that precise way given to everyone. Rather, as a significant existential state, its purpose is to point towards a more fundamental ontological or existential condition of being in the world. And this means, in turn, the purpose of the description is to point towards an ontological structure of being more generally. As such, when Sartre says that Pierre, Pierre absent haunts, haunts his cafe and is a condition of its self annihilating organisation as ground, his point is not that Pierre's specific absence is a condition for any experience of the cafe. On the contrary, he is saying that non-being in general, linked to human expectation, is a condition for that experience and for the possibility of negation. In other words, as Sartre puts it, the necessary condition for our saying not is that non-being be a perpetual presence in us and outside of us, that nothingness haunt being. And what this means in terms of Sartre's example is that though based on an individual experience, it reveals a condition of experience in general. That is, whilst non-being is only explicitly revealed to human beings in instances like absence, these states disclose a more general feature of any being in the world. Yet, we may ask, does this still not leave a further question of objectivity untouched? For even if non-being is a fundamental condition of all experience, not restricted to particular individuals at particular times, can we not still question whether it is a part of the real world as such? In different words, if a Sartre concedes non-being always appears within the limits of a human expe expectation, then isn't it still cut off from objective reality? That is, if it could not exist independently of man, isn't it still ultimately subjective? For Sartre, the answer is a definitive no. And returning to our central concern, it is, it is his answer to this which allows us to see both how real non-being is theoretically explicable and how we can first understand man as relation. For, for we see what is necessary here is that man does not merely passively experience being. That is, he does not passively relate to it as something immutably just there. Rather, he actually transforms and perverts it. And what he transforms is what would otherwise be the under, inert and undifferentiated in itself. For as that says of being, in order for it to parcel itself into, into differentiated complexes, which refer to one another and can, be, and can be used, it is necessary that negation rise up. In other words, it is necessary that non-being is imposed by man on being so that it can be differentiated and recognisable as a world. And it is then clear how this answers our question regarding objectivity. For if non-being is a limiting cutting into being by a being, then it can be both dependent on man and the real part of the world. In different words, if this transformation, which is non-being, is a real change carved into the structure of being itself, rather than projected onto it, then we need not see it as subjective. And thus we will, thus we will have answered with this the central objection to the intelligibility of real non-being. Yet, didn't we also say that in addressing this question, we would be able to address the central concern of our paper? Didn't we say that, is, that in explaining how non-being can be both dependent on man and yet objectively part of the world, we will be able to grasp a non-humanist conception of man. We did. And to understand how this is the case, we need to cast a glance backward to the start of our discussion. But we began there by saying we could avoid the ontological assumption of humanism, that uh, man is a, a mode of substantial entity, by looking at pure reflective experience. In other words, we said we could bypass the assumption implicit in its inquiry into man's distinct object of knowledge by describing an experience existing prior to reflective theory. And what we found there, in fact, did undermine the humanist presumption. This is because, properly described, pre-reflective experience revealed no substantial self independent of the world. Instead, what we found was only intentional awareness of transcendent objects. In short, we discovered that we were nothing other than the world, and yet somehow, somehow a relation to it. We intuited, put differently, that we existed as a positive relation to that world, as having no, as having no substance di distinct from it, yet still standing out from it. However, the problem was then how we rendered this intuition theoretically intelligible. That is, the problem was how we made this intuition of ourselves as a, non as a non substantial relation to the world, as nothing other than world, yet not world, make sense. And our first step towards doing this was with negation. This was because negation represented a relation to world which was nonetheless without which, which nonetheless without any separate substance stands out from it. 
And continuing, therefore, looking into, the, into this to grasp the meaning of man as relation, as relation we uncovered real, real negation. That is, we saw that underpinning man as essentially worldly, yet distinct from the world, was non-being as something real. And this, in turn, indicated a solution to our problem. For if negation was real, then it could be a relation that was part of the world, yet, as its contradiction, a non-substantial standing out from it. In short, if there was non-being existing parasitically on the world, we could have the being of a relation that did not require anything existing behind or on the other side of that relation. Yet non-being also, we saw, presented a new problem. For if the idea of non-being indicates how man as a substan- as, as non-substantial relation to the world can be intelligible, it does so at the cost of a new question of intelligibility. In other words, it does so by raising the question of how then we can make sense of real non-being. This is because it will be claimed that non-being can make sense only as a subjective concept or projection. And this is particularly because, as Sartre's description of absence acknowledges, non-being is always dependent on human expectation. However, this is where our recent discussion of modification comes in. For if, as we argued, non-being is a real transformation of being by man, actually destabilizing undifferentiated full being, then this apparent contradiction can be reconciled. That is to say, if, quote, man's relation with being is that he can modify it, then non-being can be both part of the world and, and dependence on man. And if this is the case, then we can see how this answers the question of a non-humanist conception of man. But with this idea of modification, we will then have shown how real non-being is intelligible, and hence how man as relation to world can be understood. In different words, we will have shown how if man is the modification of being that is non-being, then he can, still, then he can both possess no substance distinct from the world, and yet, not, yet still not be reducible to it. And in this way, then, we'll, we will have, in turn, answered Heidegger's charge against existentialism. For we will have shown how a conception of man can be developed in Sartre's philosophy that is not humanist. In short, we will have shown against familiar criticisms how existentialism's concern for man does not entail commitment to a discredited or naive humanist conception of the subject.